that one up our sleeve in order to uh, you know, keep things uh, relevant to the topics that we're discussing in the coming months. Um, June's mission outreach begins tomorrow, and that will be the paid forward with kindness. And so, as usual, we'll have our table out in the lobby with all of the information uh, that is requested there. So, if you would, uh, at some point in the next few days or weeks, stop by and take a look at that with us. Uh, next Sunday, this is extremely important, we will be starting service at 10 a.m. So I will be standing here at 10 a.m. And we will do our announcements and start service. If you come late, that is okay. But uh, we will be doing 10 o'clock going forward uh, into the future. Uh, June has got a uh, couple schedules with the confirmations. So in the bulletin, if you're a parent, whether you're here present or online, check that because we have the dates listed for when we will have confirmation. We will meet three times in June and then twice in July and twice in August. Uh, we will have confirmation this coming Wednesday evening at six o'clock though as normal. And then next Sunday is our Bible study. Again, <clears throat> due to summer kind of starting, we will be uh, going to only once a month on the Bible study, so we'll do it on the Sundays that we have our communion, except July 4th. So we won't do anything that night, obviously, for July 4th. Any other announcements or anything that anybody needs to bring to the congregation? Yeah. Yes. Um, the Early Learning Center is asking the churches to provide part of our lunch during the summer. Um, the ELC will be providing the fruits and the veggies, and we're asking folks to volunteer just to provide the main dish. Simple things like a hot dog, a beef burger, frozen pizza, mac and cheese, just simple stuff that the kids like. And um, we have four dates left to fill for Lutherans, so I will leave a sign up. It has my name. A number on it if you would be willing to help us out all right so make sure you check out that is if you're able to help um, donate or pick up one of those days that would be greatly appreciated any other announcements or anything that needs to be brought before the congregation if not then I invite you to stand as we prepare our hearts and minds for our service today in the name of the Father Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and to whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives all of our sins. And as a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated.
please join me in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to make the confessions of true faith. We acknowledge your glorious eternal trinity, and we adore the unity of your majestic work. Defend us by this faith from all adversary and oppression to your way. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the first lesson today is taken from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. We'll read responsively from chapter 29 of Psalms, and I'll begin. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Worship the Lord in the beauty of The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of thunder. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon like a calf, and the mount burning like a wild fox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the old trees cry, and the And in the temple of the Lord all are crying, Glory! The Lord sits in the throne of the flood. The Lord sits in the throne of the king of the Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. The second lesson is taken from Acts, chapter 2, verses 14a and verses 22 through 36. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your one see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. 
You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants to, on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of, of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God, Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel message today is going to be out of Acts chapter 4, beginning of the 32nd verse. And we had visited, visited this text once before, but we're going to look at it a little bit different this week. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him were his own, but they had everything in common. And with the great power of the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were landowners or houses sold them and brought their proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to any as and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who had been called by the apostles Barnabas, which is the son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We look at these passages in Acts over and over and over again, as we have in these last eight weeks together. We've talked about how they've come together and have distributed everything amongst themselves. We've seen passages where they have gone out into the world and have established the early church. We've looked at all of these little pieces to this big puzzle. Now, we could have started with Acts chapter 1 and moved through the first handful of chapters and have painted this um, calendar, this picture, if you would, of the, the events in order. But I think sometimes it's better for us to actually see what actually goes on behind the scenes and not just to say, okay, this is a passage of Acts, but how does this really relate to what we're doing today? And as we've looked at some of these passages, I really just keep getting hung up on, on this idea of community in the early church. And I think that is ex still excruciatingly important for us today. Because without community, the church doesn't exist. Without community, we're simply just a bunch of people who come together once a Sunday, sing a few songs, say a prayer, hear a message, and go home. See, in the early church, these individuals came together almost daily and broke bread with each other. They spent time listening to the preaching of the word. They spent time hearing the gospel every single Sunday and multiple times during the week. It wasn't just an hour on Sunday that these individuals surrendered, but it was multiple hours because they couldn't get enough of the gospel. See, this was fresh news to them. So imagine being at some point in your life and hearing about the gospel for the first time and just remembering how, how much fire you had in you to have to come and hear it again and how much it is structured today that you only hear it on Sunday mornings. 
Sure, you can turn the TV on and maybe get to a channel that is circulating some sort of gospel, but chances are you will never hear the true gospel on TV. Chances are pretty high. You might be able to go to the internet and find sermons on YouTube or Facebook. You have a better opportunity there to find good biblical preaching where you can hear the gospel being proclaimed. But see, you're not in true community. More than likely, you're sitting in your office behind a computer. Maybe you've got earbuds in or you've got your speakers on and you're by yourself listening to what is being told to you. You might be at work even, sitting at your desk, being able to listen freely. But again, this is you by yourself. And see, this is the, this is the problem I find that the church today is having. This idea of community. And I don't think it's a bad problem. I just think we need to learn how to adapt to it. See, it's not like the early church where they would just gather in person and that's how the message was proclaimed. They didn't have a fancy camera system and, and a microphone and the internet to broadcast their message. They basically had one person who could yell really loud and that was it. And then that's how the message spread, was word of mouth. And today, we're faced with this challenge of how do we incorporate those who are online, those who are watching around the world, how do we incorporate them into our community? How can we say that you are a part of a church if you only have an opportunity to watch online? Or do you feel that you're a part of a community when you go home during the week and you follow through with services online? be a whatever church or preacher that you fancy. Now, I don't talk about it very often because I, I don't like to really put myself out there, but one of the things that I've really noticed in, in my ministry career so far in these shoot, few short months and leading up to this point is I've had a significant impact on some social media platforms. I'm on Instagram and I have... A large following there and through that moment I've been able to share the gospel with people all over the world and to go off of that I even host a podcast which I put out on the Facebook page earlier this week and in that I have reached people all over the world I have listeners in Russia and in China India Africa South America I get about 4,000 people on a monthly basis listening to my show. And that's not anything for me to stand here and boast or gloat about, but my, my point is being this. I have seen how the gospel can reach people all over the world. And so we come to this idea of how can we define this new idea of community? Because we, we go to scripture and we see all of these examples in scripture where the Gospels be proclaimed in person. If we go to the Old Testament, that is exactly how they, the prophets went. They went into the crowds and went into the people and proclaimed the message. In the New Testament, that's exactly what the apostles did. But today we have all of this technology that connects us with each other. And so we have to figure out how can we incorporate those who can't be here. How can we look and say, we understand that there are just some people who physically can't be here. And that's okay. But do we still incorporate them into our community? Can we still actually reach them physically? Now, we might just get people passing by on the internet. And they might just come across this sermon today and they may listen to it. And they're not from the United States. They might be from somewhere else in the world. So how would we engage with them? Can we... In check, incorporate them into our community. Now, obviously, if you're sitting here in these pews, this is what community looks like. Individuals from all sorts of different points in their lives coming together to do one thing, and that is worship Jesus Christ. And so we could say collectively, in person, we are acting as a community. But let's look at this from both of these perspectives here. And let's look at it and how it reflects to the early church. So, <clears throat> as we've moved here 
and come to this point, we have finally reached the end of our series on the early church. You know, as I had mentioned early here in the sermon, we could have done a historical walkthrough. We could have touched all of these very important points, and those are all well and fine, and we'll get to them. But I wanted to make this a little bit more unconventional. I wanted to make this unique because I wanted to talk about some of the things that happened on behind the scenes. The challenges that the apostles faced, the false teachings that arose and that are really still relevant today, unfortunately. And so as we get to kind of the end of this, I felt like it was only appropriate to end this series with this message on the importance of community. The importance of coming together on a, on a weekly basis in fellowship to worship Jesus Christ. And as you remember when we were doing our little skit last week, that was one of my high points for the weekend, was to just come and have fellowship with you. See, this isn't a separation of me being any different than you, because we're all doing the same thing. Just because I'm up here giving you this message doesn't mean I don't get to hear my words spoken and get to participate in the songs and the prayers being said. We're all a part of this community together. So just as the early church has flourished, they meet on a regular basis. And as you would read through the book of Acts, this is the premise, this is the, the movement that the apostles take. And they do so at such a normal pace here. They, they, they come together so regularly that this is what really was the fire behind the early church. Just imagine, I just kind of want to segue here just a minute, but just imagine if we met four days a week. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, that's just unconventional, Pastor. There's no way I could do this. No, nope. you're lucky you get me one hour a Sunday. And by the way, that sermon you're preaching... Better get her down quick because I'm itching to leave and go do something else. But see, that's what the early church did. They didn't have constraints of the life. They didn't care about all of the things that the world was telling us that we needed to do. They came and listened to the gospel. And even, at, even if we get to the point of the Reformation, when Luther was preaching, Luther preached seven days a week, multiple times during the day. In fact, that there was a structure that the early morning preachings or Sunday preachings would be, uh, the Sunday mornings would be a gospel message. And then in the evenings would probably be a psalm that they would work through. And then during the mornings, during the week, would be an Old Testament passage. And then they would go to a New Testament passage in the evenings. And they would go through the entire Bible so quickly because they would be doing it seven days a week. And these people during the Reformation, as the gospel exploded back into the world, they just were hungry for it. And then we kind of cool things back down as time moves on and we're back to a, a Sunday morning meeting. And again, I'm blessed to be here to preach on Sunday morning. But I find that community just doesn't stop at 10.30, 11.30, or 12 o'clock. Community continues on into the week where we can pick up the phone and call somebody in our church and, and talk to them. I've got this problem and I just need some guidance. I'm struggling with this sin and I need help. Or just to go and have lunch with somebody, to just engage with people. See, community just doesn't stop when the service ends. Our job continues on as Christians into the work week as we go forward, even with people outside of our congregation, as we engage with other Christians as we look to spread this gospel message that we talked about last week. So I think I've already kind of illustrated this idea of what community means, but I want to see if, if there's maybe something else in your mind that it might mean. Is there anything that I may have missed in this point here? And obviously it means more than just coming to church on, sur on Sunday mornings. But see, does it mean that I have to come and then I can just not participate in the needs of the church? I like to come, but I don't like reading. I don't want to acolyte. I don't want to be an usher. See, being a part of this community means being involved in so much more than just showing up on Sunday. 
It means being a part of a family. And inside of a family, there are jobs that are given to all people. And just as being the hands and feet of Christ inside of the church, we all have some level of responsibility to ensure that the church continues to move forward. And then obviously the daunting question is, must I have fellowship with other people? Do I have to actually go and be nice to my neighbor? Do I have to break bread with them? Do I have to participate in their lives? Do I have to get to know them? I got my own problems. I don't need somebody else's on my plate. So as we answer these questions and continue to unpack this sort of concept of community, we can only do but look at the Word of God as being our guide and our focus. But let's face it here. As we start to get to this topic, it's daunting. I've been here six months. Today is the end of my first six months being here. You think about it already? Six months? It started in December. And now we're knocking on the door of June. I just, I'm blown away. It feels like we just started a couple days ago. It's been amazing at how fast time goes. But as me and my wife have moved here from another state, we moved everything we had. We gave up our lives in Illinois and we came here. And being here for only six months, we still have some work to do in, in order to acclimate ourselves into the community. But I feel like we have been welcomed with open arms. We have been brought into this wonderful body of Christians. We've been just shown undescribable hospitality. People who have been willing to just come and have a word and talk and enjoy fellowship with me and my wife. We have been so blessed to have come to this church. But what about somebody who's not a pastor? What about somebody who just happens to stumble into this church on their own? They may live in Stratford or Boone or Dayton or some surrounding town here. They may just hear me preaching on Facebook and decide, well, it's a short drive. I can come up there on a Sunday morning. How do we welcome those individuals? Do we embrace them with open arms? And do we welcome them into this family, even if they only come one time? Do we accept them as a brother or sister in Christ? And I find that being a pastor, you're kind of maybe given a little bit of uh, extra grace coming into a new community. Because you guys welcomed us here. You guys brought us here. You guys chose for us to come here. And so as a pastor, you kind of just come into a church that's already willing to get to know you. But sometimes I find that if you step into a new church and you're not the pastor, how does that feel? Now, I've been in countless churches, and I'm sure you all have been too. Did you feel that when you walked in those doors that you were welcomed as somebody who had been there for 50 years? Do you feel like you were welcomed, that they felt like they had known you since you were a child? Or were you just another head that gets counted and you just threw some money in the offering plate because that's what we do as Christians and you go on about your week? Sometimes this idea of community can be distorted in today's world because sees the church, we get so focused on our members that we lose sight of even trying to go out and reach the lost. So should the church be purposeful in welcoming new guests? Absolutely, we should be. In fact, it should be our task to seek out new people into the church and welcome them and greet them. Why? I think it's obvious. Because see... That's what the church has been designated through the history of our existence. We're a rescue station. Open doors to the broken world. And I pray that every Sunday my sermons go out into the world and, and 
by the working of the Holy Spirit, not by me, but by the grace of God. Somebody who hears this sermon may finally decide to come to church. That they may say, you know what, yes, I need to be a part of something. I have had this hole in my soul that has just been burning for answers. And so I'm going to step into church. And the question then becomes, is, are we going to be cognizant of that person? If we look around to our church today, we can say that most of the people here attend on a fairly regular basis. But what happens when we get a new person, essentially a stranger in our pews? Do we as a church congregation go out of our way to welcome them? Do we take the opportunity to ensure that they know that they're welcomed there every Sunday? And then do we hand them our phone number and say, we'd love to talk to you and get to know you more. We'd love to know your story. We'd love to be a part of your life. And, you know, as I had put together this message, I was told in my interview process just the community's mindset of Stratford Lutheran. And this particular individual had told me that when they had started coming to this church a number of years ago, they had felt this overwhelming welcoming. They walked into the building and they felt like they were at home. And they never felt this anywhere else. And I'll tell you, when I came here in November and I preached, I felt like that too. I know that I had, had no idea what God would be doing on that particular Sunday when Janae and I pulled up. But when we were greeted at the doors and we were standing out in the lobby, introducing ourselves to people, I felt like we were at home. I felt like we'd been here for 20 years. It's hard to explain, but the community aspect is alive and well, but we need to just take this a little bit further, I feel. So we're going to look at this from two angles, inside of the church body and outside, because now we have technology to where we can stream our services. How are we going to engage those people? Well, let's talk about Sunday morning and our activities within this body. So as I've kind of talked here, I want to really make sure we get this definition of community. It's a group of people living in the same place and having a particular characteristic in common. Hmm. Well, I think that we all live in the same vicinity. We all come here for the same purpose. That is to hear Jesus Christ and to worship him. And so I can say that we are a community based upon the uh, definition given. So, in this church, we come together every Sunday. Just as the church does in Acts. Whether we're looking at chapter 2 after Peter preaches at Pentecost, or we move on into Acts chapter 4, or even when we go all the way to 17, which we read last week when Paul goes out into Greece and preaches. He does so on Sunday mornings. And in Acts chapter 2, there's a passage where this community comes and they, they sell everything that they have in order to fund the community. And on top of that, they come and they break bread with each other every time they meet. And so, as this early church does, as they come together daily to break bread and have fellowship with each other and hear the word proclaimed, we do so as well. Ours may be a little bit different structured today, but we still have the same underlining purpose. And even though we're not meeting on a daily basis, if you want to see me after church, we can make something happen. But if we're not meeting on the daily basis, though, we still have weekly and other events that unpack and unfold throughout the month. In fact, on the third Tuesday of every month, I'm pretty sure I'm correct on this, the third Tuesday of every month, the women of the word, right? They come together and they meet and they study scripture. For the youth, we have confirmation every Wednesday night. 
where we come together and we go through the catechism and we go through scripture and we talk about faith and the building of faith and we talk about what God's word is telling us. Bi-weekly, we hold Bible studies here in the church. And the whole congregation is more than welcome to either participate in person or online. And coming soon, hopefully here in the month of June, maybe July, we're going to bring back fellowship hour. More than likely it'll be before church since we'll be starting at 10 o'clock. But look forward to something like that. I look forward to something like that. Having people come together to where we can just talk and have fellowship with each other again. You can have some coffee and maybe a donut. Or we'll work out the details. But I really want to stress the importance of actually being present here on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> And I know, unfortunately, some are physically not able to attend. I know that sometimes we get to a point in our lives where our bodies just don't cooperate with us. I know that sometimes we are facing an illness, or we have a family emergency, or we're just simply on vacation, and we can't be present every Sunday. And for those who happen to fall into those categories, we should, as a church, not neglect them. We should still be breaking bread with them, enjoying fellowship with them. Even if it's a phone call, for those who can't be present in the church, it should be our duty as a church body, mine most importantly, to be out engaging with these individuals, ensuring that they know the church still knows of them and loves them deeply. But for those who are able, our doors are always open. The sanctuary is always open. And this church isn't a place for the self-righteous. This isn't a place for, all who have, for somebody who has all of the answers. But this is a place for the broken. This is a place for the sinner to come. This is a place for those who need Christ's word in their ears. And this is why we come together every Sunday. So that way you can hear the preaching of Christ and his forgiveness and have that renewed faith in your ears. We come together every Sunday to continue and build on our relationship with Christ and what he's done for us. And we continue to build our relationship with each other. Unfortunately, if we miss out on this for multiple Sundays, even one Sunday, it can be detrimental. In fact, we could start to essentially be spiritually starved. <clears throat> Jesus tells us that he is, in fact, the bread of life. And so when we come together to hear his preaching, we are being fed his word. Jesus Christ is the word. And so when we hear the preaching of that, our spirits are renewed, our faith is renewed, and we can go on into this world and encounter the battles we face daily. And if we happen to miss a Sunday service, or we maybe miss three or four or five or six months worth of Sunday services, you could really find yourself into some deep spiritual depression. And that's the truth. I've experienced it. It's terrible. And that is why coming together on a Sunday morning and being in fellowship with each other is so crucial to the Christian body. I'm not standing here and, and demanding you to be here every Sunday, but what I am is telling us that in the light of what Christ has done for us, we have the freedom in Christ to come on Sundays. And it just makes sense for us to be present with each other because see, when we are in community with each other, we can renew each other. Lift up each other in prayer. Hold each other through the storms that life gives us. And just be present with each other. You have the renewal of faith being spoken to you by Jesus Christ. As we go through the Bible and as we encounter passages, we have the faith being renewed in our ears. And so it's okay to miss a service. It's perfectly fine to have life happen to us. If you're sick, you're sick. Stay home and get healthy. 
And this is why we broadcast now online. Because we want people to at least hear the message on Sundays. So that way they don't miss out. We want people to be here, but we know that it is impossible for some. And that is why the aspect of community does extend outside of these four walls. So as we talked earlier, these events that we do within the church here, they're open to all people, even those in the community. If somebody from the Baptist church or the Methodist church wants to come in, they're more than welcome to. I would welcome them in with open arms to our Bible studies. Because it's only right for us to break bread with fellow Christians. Even these confirmation classes. If you want to come, you're more than welcome to. Get a nice little refresher of your catechism. But see, we do these events not to check boxes on your salvation to-do list. We don't check these boxes to ensure that you will make it to heaven because you did all of these wonderful things. We do these so that way we can experience the Word of God frequently. I know Luther said it, I'm sure many have said it before, I have to hear the gospel every day or I forget it. I mean, by the time you get to Wednesday and Thursday, you kind of forget what pastor said on Sunday, don't you? And that's fine, because I do. I forget by 12 o'clock. <laughs> Half the time, I don't even remember what I said, and that's normal for me. But see, we get to this point in the week where the world is pressing in on us, our family needs and our lives, our jobs, everything press in on us, and we just happen to forget it. And that is why it is so important for us to hear the gospel as often as possible. And so these relationships we build and we cultivate really start to flourish. This is where they become important. This is where we can call among and upon each other and just pray with each other, to live with each other, to love each other. Because let's face it, Christianity isn't a lone ranger religion. You can't just be present and go your entire life by yourself without ever actually meeting another Christian. It doesn't work like that. Faith doesn't work like that. The Bible doesn't work like that. This is a community relationship here. It's a community religion. We come together with like beliefs and a like understanding of who Jesus Christ is, while our pasts and even our presents are much different than everybody else's, we still have one major thing in common, and that is our love for Jesus Christ. So let us look at this account from the community aspect outside of the church. So in Acts, whether we look at chapter 4 or chapter 2, we have two accounts here where they sell all of their possessions. And all of their belongings are distributed to all of those who were in need. In the account in Acts chapter 2, it says they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Now, I'm not going to get into a discussion on money. We talked about that earlier in this series. But I want to take this from a different angle here. So instead of talking about tithing in the early church, I want to talk about this behavior that became the footprint of selfish, selfless love and sacrifice. See, in the early church, they gave up everything. They sold their land, they sold their houses, so that way others in need could be taken care of. But let me ask you this. When was the last time you witnessed a church or a community coming together to sacrificially give? This doesn't mean all of your possessions. This doesn't mean all of your money. But it does mean time, skills, and in some cases, money. Essentially, it means giving up valuable commodities to serve somebody in our community that has a need. And this passage, in fact, can often be placed as a heavy law upon you. Let me just maybe put it in a little bit different lens here. I'm not going to hover on it too long, but I really want to see, show you how some preachers can manipulate this text. I ask you this question. 
When was the last time you sold everything you ever owned and gave it to the church in order for the church to do good with it? Or, maybe a little less extreme, but when was the last time you gave everything you possibly could to the church in order for the church to do good with it? See, this type of preaching, when I stand here in the pulpit and, and give you this law, in fact, unfortunately, it creates a very unhealthy church. If all I did was sit up here and talk about money and giving and, and sacrificing, there's, eventually we're going to run out of money in the church. Eventually we're going to run out of possessions of pe things that people can donate to the church. Because if we're not doing enough good with it, then it just kind of flounders. And it really does create an unhealthy church, if this is all that I bring forward. In fact, you'll probably rarely hear me ever say anything of that sort, if never. Because I don't think that is even what the church's position today in the world should be. But instead, here in this text, I want you to see the, rich the richness of this community. I want you to experience exactly what these individuals in need had experienced. And as they come forward, they have all of these people in the church giving to them in order to help them. Because these individuals who were well off had seen a need to help those who were not. And so they came and unselfishly gave. They came and sacrificed what they could in order to help others. And as we look at the church today, this is not an idea of just throwing money into a pot. You know, we've had a number of projects going on within the church and at the parsonage, and I have seen countless people giving up their valuable time to help fix and move things forward as we look to the new age. In fact, Dave and I have had numerous hours trying to get this video system working. We spent two hours a couple weeks ago just testing the sound and ensuring that those online could hear us. Drew and I have spent time getting the new thermostats in place, ensuring that it's a comfortable Sunday experience for you, that we're not too hot or too cold. We've had experiences at the parsonage when, when Janae and I were getting ready to move in that the church just came together and came in and got everything cleaned and ready for us to move in. That's what sacrificial love looks like. It's not about just putting money into a pot and leaving. Because see, I find money is, is a great tool, but our time and skills is a much more valuable commodity in servicing the needs of each other. So no matter where you are in your walk with Christ, you can participate in these things. Whether it's coming to church and enjoying the fellowship and just being present among fellow believers. If you're the newest of Christians or the most seasoned of Christians, you have this blessing to come and enjoy fellowship. Come together to break bread with each other, to serve with each other, to go out into the world with each other, to live out what the gospel call is. That is the Great Commission, to share and witness to others. So as we continue to build our identity on Christ here in Stratford, we continue to build our identity as this church to be our community's rescue station. And I'm going to continue to plant that flag because I think it's the only one that we as a church body can do to be an open door, an open refuge for all of those who need Christ. To be a place for the broken and the lost to come and seek healing. And we will continue to preach Christ. We will continue to preach that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. And that it is by him alone that you have forgiveness of sin. It is by him alone that even if you have failed at giving in your time, your skills, or even just witnessing, when you have failed at all of these things, Christ still meets you and forgives you of these things. Because let's face it, either the church is one of these one of two things today. We are either a country club where we shut the doors and 
we become snooty and, and selfish, or we're the rescue station where we have open doors and open arms for anybody seeking Christ. And I'll tell you this, that until my time at Stratford ends, and I hope to be very, very, very old when that happens, I will preach unapologetically for Christ. I will continue to preach Him and His forgiveness for you until the end. I will keep releasing you from this law that the Scripture brings to us, that the world brings upon you. And I will continue to show you that Christ does forgive you. Because Christ still forgives you, even if you have failed, even if you have stumbled, He still forgives you. And in the end, this truth that spans 2,000 years from the early church to now, the church where Christ is preached, forgiveness and healing are for all people, for all people who believe. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please rise and join me with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Majestic Trinity, the fullness of your identity is a mystery beyond human comprehension. Yet you have chosen to reveal us your presence, your grace, and forgiveness through the word and sacraments. Teach us to worship you in the purity of heart with reverence and awe. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy three in one, you have created all things and you continue to sustain us in this world as spring turns into summer may the beauty of your creation and the never failing cycle of new beginnings keep us mindful of never failing promises to your people lord in your mercy yeah. holy one and three the mystery of your being is the perfect expression of the unity that you desire for all of your children Help us be peacekeepers and seek unity where the world would encourage us to pursue division. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Healing Lord, in you is perfect wholeness. Through the riches of your grace, bring healing to all who suffer illness, debilitating pain, grief, or will be undergoing surgeries. We especially pray for Derek Adams, Dean and Ellen Ahrens, Matt Anderson, Steve Anderson, Grant Carlson, Marilyn Carlson, Mike Carlson, Jerry Harris, Mary Jo Johnson, Donna Robinson, Ann Garvey, Steve Anderson, Marvie Anderson, Laya Berglund, and Kurt Berglund. We pray also, Lord, for the safety of, your, of the police officers and workers and the medical services and armed forces, Dylan Ahrens and Stephanie Carlson. Grant them your healing and wholeness, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all of whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.